So hello, uh, thank you for joining this wonderful event, Android Worldwide. I'm very excited to be part of it. Thank you to the organizing team for giving me this opportunity. And thank you, Mohit, for uh, being a gracious host. Today, I will be speaking about how to automate real user scenarios across multi-apps and multi-devices. It's a long title and I have not been able to think of how to make it interesting and short enough so it doesn't really roll in the mouth, but let's see how it goes. A little bit about me. I'm Anand Bagmar and I've been in the testing space. I started off in the testing space about 20 plus years ago, and then I graduated to start thinking about quality because testing is very narrow focused, a testing team activity. But when you think about quality, all different roles need to start contributing to make it a quality product. As part of my journey in this space, I worked with various different product and services organizations across the globe. Currently, I'm based out of Pune in India. And I'm also open source contributor. I've built a couple of open source tools uh, and frameworks related to automation. And I'm also a contributor on the Selenium uh, project and in some ways on the APM project as well which are one of the most popular uh, libraries for automating the browser and devices. I would love to connect with you even after this session uh, and continue the conversation forward. So with that, let's get started into this session itself. I would love to continue getting questions and uh, comments in chat uh, along the way. Uh, I will be monitoring uh, the comments and uh, question section along the way. So please do feel free to ask that as you think about it. So let's start with a first question, which is really uh, setting the grounds of why we are doing automation. In a very simplistic way, if you have to answer the question, why do we automate functional tests? The answer is really very simple. We want to simulate the user actions and behavior with the product under test. We want to do this because we want to make sure our users of the product do not face any glitches. They are able to use the functionality of your product as expected and they get value from your product because if they get value, then as an organization, you will get a lot of value based on whatever the outcomes are for that product. So this is why we want to automate these functional tests before you release your product into production or release it to production. In this case, it's probably releasing it to Play Store or App Stores of sorts. We want to have the confidence when we do this. So that's why we want to automate as much as we can. This session is going to talk about the top of the pyramid, which is the functional test, end-to-end -end test. But of course, this is not the only type of test that we would automate. We want to automate the lower layers of the pyramid as well to get faster feedback, and then you would get to the functional test. So we'll focus on the top of the pyramid. Okay. To do this type of automation, it is important for us to understand the application under test really well. In the simplistic terms, we need to think about how is your product going to be available to the end users? Is it a web-based product? Is it going to be mobile web as well? Or are these native applications? And will those be used on mobiles, tablets, browsers? You need to understand uh, that well before you start thinking about how to automate. You also need to understand the architecture of your application really well. That will help you figure out what are the vulnerable areas in your product application in the architecture where you need to focus on getting better, uh, building more automated tests so that you have got the confidence of quality. And then you get to the top of the pyramid again as how your users will be using the application. Now, when you understand this application well, 
you will start thinking about what are the scenarios that you need to automate. A good way to represent this is in terms of a flowchart or a mind map or a state diagram, whichever way that works for you as an individual, you need to start thinking about who are the personas and what are the business actions, business values that they can accomplish on your product to get to the desired end state. Now, a desired end state, for example, if it's a, let's say, an e-commerce application where you're able to purchase products, a desired end state is the user placing an order, the order getting delivered, and there is no return on that order, right? That's a desired end state. But there could be many other intermediate desired end states as well. For example, the user logs in and does nothing. That's a desired end state. Without logging in, the user comes, searches uh, for certain types of products, sees the details of the products. That's it. That's again a desired end state. In some cases, you would log in, search for a product, add it to the cart, and that's it. That's a, another desired end state. It is very important to understand these journeys based on the persona, maybe as a logged in user, as a, a non-logged in user, as an admin, as a super admin, whatever those different personas might be, for each of the personas, what are the desired end states? In terms of business rules, business values, business functions, whatever is the nomenclature you use in your team, you would map those out, you would prioritize those, and based on the priority, you would start automating those. And that is a solved problem if you really think about it. How to automate this is a solved problem. There's nothing new in that. There are hundreds of options. Just a few of them are listed on the screen over here in front of you. But there are hundreds of options that you could literally choose from how you want to automate these scenarios that you have identified. What I want to share with you today is yet another option one more option how you could do this and i will tell you why that option is a very interesting one as well the option that i'm talking about is an open source framework that i have built called testwiz now if you take the scenario for example a user is going to e-commerce application the user goes to the web uh, app searches for a product Adds, uh, see the, sees the product details, adds the product to cart, and verifies uh, the product is added successfully to the cart, right? That's my journey. That's my scenario that I want to automate. That is the type of scenario that we are trying to automate using TestWiz. In this case, let's look at an example, and I'll use a different example. I'll use an example of... It could be Teams for that matter, or Zoom, or GeoMeet, or uh, any product that you really want, right? Any video conferencing uh, application. This is a scenario for that. And the scenario says that the chat should be disabled for a one person in meeting. If there is only one person in the meeting, the chat option should be disabled. Seems obvious, right? Who are you going to chat with? Where is the message going to go? So in this case, using Gherkin language, in this particular case, I'm using Cucumber JVM as a tool to, as a library to specify this Gherkin language. And I'm going to automate that using TestWiz. So in this case, I'm talking about an API call that the framework will make to create a new account dynamically as part of the test implementation. Using the created account, we will log in. After logging in, this user should be able to start a new meeting and we are going to verify the chat option is disabled. Now, this way of specifying your scenario, your test intent is very important because it explicitly calls out how the actions are being done. So in this particular case, the first step is implemented as an API call. 
the annotations on the scenario is determining is uh, specifying what is the platform where the test is going to run is it android is it web is it ios is it windows mac whatever platform your test can be implemented on you would specify that and very important though is you are specifying the steps in form of your business functionality you are not talking about ui actions which very easily becomes a norm when you are trying to automate at the top of the pyramid automate your functional tests it is a lot of thought now that you need to put in when you have to specify or create these steps in a business language which also makes it gives the added advantage of making it platform agnostic this is how testwiz encourages you to implement your tests of course it's not a hard way of uh, implementing but it's a very opinionated framework how you should be implementing your tests now talking about implementation this is the intent how you are specifying it here is how the architecture of testwiz itself looks we are specifying our test intent using cucumber jvm i'm going to use a laser pointer here so we are specifying a test intent using cucumber jvm these steps will be implemented in a layer of the framework called that i like to call as business layer this is where your domain functionality is implemented this is where your actions verifications and rules are going to be placed business layer methods will can call other business layer methods but once it gets to the actual implementation they will talk to the pages or the screens which will actually interact with your application under test in the device or in the browser to get those actions done or get information back from those uh, from the device or the browser the core library itself supports web mobile web android ios and windows applications it also has support for making api calls for web we use web driver uh, in the java language uh, for native apps and desktop applications we use apm which internally uses apm test distribution library which is again in the java language for web service calls we uh, use unires java client so then the core library is going to have the ability to interact with these devices manage these devices also it would have ability to do logging and reporting driver management various other utilities the test itself can be executed uh, on a device or browsers on your local machine or it could be in any device farm as well and we also have a uh, very good reporting in terms of using report portal and app tools as i will show shortly in a demo there is a lot of configurability in the framework lot of different types of utilities pretty much the intent is that you should be able to take this library and just focus on writing your tests not do nothing else don't worry about building a framework why do we want to reinvent the wheel so with that let me show you a quick demo of how this is going to work i'll start off with a simple example where we are going to run the test on a an android device my command is a simple gradle run command but i am providing a lot of different parameters at run time which is going to be used for execution of the test so let's so uh, i'll quickly you know, i'll just go back uh, apologies for that i got uh, dropped from the platform uh, that was very strange but i was explaining the test with architecture where uh, we've got a test intent business layers which actually does the implementation of the business rules that is where the assertions are then there are pages or screens which is actually going to interact with your browser or device and get the actions done on that particular application and retrieve information from the application we've got uh, support for various different types of reports 
in report portal. Uh, we do visual testing using Apply tools, and there are different additional types of reports as well, which we'll see shortly in the demo. Uh, so let's start the demo. In this case, I'm going to run a test on an Android device. The command is uh, a simple Gradle run command, and you can give it a lot of different configuration options to run specific types of tests. In this particular case, I have two emulators running on my local uh, machine, and I have launched the test execution on command line. I'm going to keep skipping forward a little bit uh, to in interest of time. We see the application has launched on one of the devices. The test is running over there. And there are validations happening in, uh, at various points of this implementation. And the test eventually completes as well, successfully. What this means now is you have authored your test. I use IntelliJ IDEA. You could use any IDE of your choice. But I can run the test locally using command line arguments, test it on local browsers or devices connected locally or running as emulators or simulators. Or the device could be in any device farm as well. I'm able to run the test locally and make sure everything is fine. Once it's verified, I'm going to push my code uh, to a version control system. It could be Azure, GitHub. GitLab, any version control system that you use, where you will do a build and as part of the release process or deployment process, at relevant points in time, you would run the test automatically, again, using the same command line that you used to run it locally. The reports in both cases will be seen in a report portal and visual testing will be done via Apply tools. So the approach has been you run the test the same way as you would run in CI. That way, there are no surprises. You don't need to do any additional or different things when uh, you have to run the test in your pipeline. And you can be very confident that it will work the same way as it was working locally. So this is a solved problem. But there is another type of complexity, which is there in a lot of applications, not necessarily all applications, but a lot of applications. And that is a very uh, interesting use case to solve from a test -wiz perspective. We are living in a hyper-connected world. This particular conference itself is an example of that, where everyone is connected from different parts of the world. But we are sharing, uh, you're able to see my screen share, you're able to send comments, uh, questions, uh, and we are able to interact in real time what is going on. In this type of situation where we are living in a hyper-connected world, which is a world of collaboration and interactions, how are you going to automate such scenarios? So for example, I am doing a screen share. I am able to uh, speak, show my video. And there was a glitch. And Mohit immediately reached out saying there's a problem. I need to simulate such scenarios as well from automation to make sure this interaction is going well. I'm able to think about these multi-user interactions as well. And this is where, again, TestWiz comes into the picture. So let's look at how we can solve these interesting use cases. So the first use case I want to talk about is a multi-user use case, where the users could be on web, mobile web, Android, iOS, Windows, Mac, Linux, anywhere that you want. But they could be connecting and collaborating with each other as part of the same uh, type of application. Of course, application will be different for each of these devices or operating systems. But they are still able to interact seamlessly with each other. So let's look at how TestWiz will solve this problem. Here's an example of a scenario which depicts this challenge. Over here, we are saying the guest who is on Android and the host who is also on Android can send a file over chat in the meeting. 
So this is about sharing a file with another person in a meeting. So in this case, the way the implementation, the business rules work is the host signs up as a new uh, user using APIs, logs in and then starts a meeting. The guest joins the meeting from another Android device. Now the host should be able to get to the chat window and send a file in the chat message. And the guest should be able to receive that file in his chat uh, window. That is the scenario. So what TestWiz is encouraging you to do is make it very explicit who is the user, who is the persona who is doing the action, and where is that user coming from. That is one additional thing that is happening as compared with the earlier scenario. In this case, let's look at how the test is going to be. So in this particular case, there are two users, both of them are coming on Android and the annotation is multi-user Android. That is what tells TestWiz there are multiple personas in this scenario and all of them are coming from Android. In this case, again, I have launched the test uh, from my command line with the appropriate parameters. There are two emulators connected. The host has launched the application, is signing in because the user has already created using APIs. The host has signed in. The host is starting the meeting. And the host is the only person in the call. At this point in time, the guest also starts the application and joins the same meeting that was created by the host. When the host, when the guest has joined this meeting, we see in each device, the second persona is already there. And now the rest of the orchestration can continue. This becomes now a very interesting way where one test is able to orchestrate between multiple types of devices. Let's also look at how this actually works in TestWiz. So here's another example where in this case, what we are doing is we are telling TestWiz create a driver for this particular persona. And that persona is used in the implementation. So TestWiz manages the driver instances. It takes care of connecting to the device, making the uh, sure the app is installed, connecting to that device, and doing the interactions as appropriate. And then in subsequent steps, you would be able to use that persona to simply switch the context and do the actions as required. So in that sense, it's a very simple approach. It's all about doing the driver management based on the persona. Of course, there's a lot of background work that you need to do in terms of making sure the device is available and it is being allocated. It's not getting reused uh, by another test, for example. There's a lot of such management that needs to happen, but all of that is abstracted out for the users. And this is how that implementation would happen. So this is the business layer where the business operations are implemented. It will communicate with the relevant screens, do the actions on them, get information and do the assertions. These are the business assertions that are very important to make sure the test is actually doing what is expected from it. The way this test runs is the configuration parameters I spoke about. There are a lot of different configuration options that we have. There are different set of capabilities that you would be able to specify to communicate with your device appropriately. These capabilities would of course need to be extended and changed based on which device farm you might be using because each of them have their own different way of communication or some proprietary uh, capabilities as well that give you better or different control on it. And that is how the implementation would happen. So this is how TestWiz solves the problem of multi-users. It gives you the capability of how to run multi-user tests on the same platform. But 
the same thing can happen on multiple platforms as well the example i showed is about two users on android devices what about users on different platforms so in this case the example is host is on web guest is on android and the annotation over here is multi user android web multi user android web or multi user android does not indicate how many users are there it just tells testways there are going to be multiple drivers that are required over here please manage it appropriately so that is what is happening in this type of scenario and if i have to run this test which is again very similar to the earlier one except one is on android the other is on web i run the same thing again from command line i have two devices here the first device is picked up the test starts on android user has log host has logged in the meeting is started and at this point instead of the second device being used the browser has launched and in the browser the guest user is joining the same meeting as the host has started and that is how the interaction is going to continue the orchestration is going to continue okay so once this aspect of driver management is taken care of then there is no limit of how many different types of scenarios you can really implement in this case there is also another type of scenario where you can have multiple different types of applications involved in the orchestration so let's take an example let's say you're going to place an order uh, on amazon so as a user you use the amazon app you shop for it you place an order from here and of course this is a very very simplistic view of the e-commerce world but once the order is placed payment is done the warehouse processes the order ships the items to the local delivery station from where the delivery uh, agents are going to come to the uh, delivery address and deliver the product once the product is delivered the order status is confirmed as delivered in this case there are various different types of personas and each persona would be using a different type of application to process that order to help process that order end to end there is also another type of scenario where different versions of the same application might be in, uh, used so for example if we take zoom you could have some users on one version some users on another version but you want to see if the compatibility is there if you can still do the same functions achieve the same functionality regardless of the version of the application and these might be very interesting and depending on the type of application might be a uh, very important type of scenarios to automate as well because you cannot keep repeating these same things manually over and over again so how does testwiz solve this problem we already know the step indicates who is doing the action which app is doing the action is an added dimension now on this and of course where is that user coming from so in this particular case if i have to show this from code it's a matter of simple coding to uh, implement this if i look into this implementation so this is a step which says a person or a host is logging in and starts a meeting in some version of the application on which platform so all i'm doing over here is retrieving the name of the application based on that application i'm passing that to testwiz and testwiz figures out how to get this application so in this particular case i'm saying it is geomeet latest that is the application so it is going to pick up the properties for geomeet latest from here so there's geomeet there's geomeet latest capabilities file so there is a simple nomenclature that you need to be aware of and based on that you could just pass that information to testwiz it will be able to pick up the relevant capabilities file and using that capabilities file 
Testwiz will instantiate the driver or install that app on the device for this particular persona. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is a very simple way to manage your personas, the drivers and versions of the application. And once the driver is created, there's a mapping created for that. Then it is simple interaction. Just switch the context to that driver and perform the actions on that driver to implement the test. So let's look at an example of a multi-user web app. In this case, I have two users on Android. Each of the user is using a different version of the GeoMeet application. And there's a third user who is coming on the web on Chrome browser. And there is no versions in that sense, right? It's on the web. So whatever is latest deployed, that will be available. Again, just running a simple command line with specific properties to run that type of test. We see the first user has launched the app, host is signing in. After signing in, the meeting has started. The host is the only person in the meeting. Now the second guest or other first guest, second user is going to run the uh, launch the app on the second device that is available. This is a different version of the application. In this case, it's hard to notice, but the versions are actually different of this application. But now this guest has joined the same meeting and both of them are there in the same meeting, which we can see over here easily. Now the third user, the second guest is starting, uh, wants to connect to the same meeting, but that user is coming from the web. They join the same meeting, and now you can see there are three people in this meeting. Once all the users are there, matter of again just switching the driver context and doing the interaction with them to get the implementation done. Okay. So this is how TestWiz solves the problem of multi-app or multi-user uh, uh, scenarios, multi-platform scenarios. And that gives you the ability now to automate the scenarios which were seemingly difficult to automate in normal circumstances. Let's look at what kind of output is generated from these. So TestWiz creates three different types of reports. The first one is report portal where we will be able to see in report portal, the details of the test that has executed. So in this particular case, uh, I ran the test just a couple of hours ago. Whichever tags were used to run the test that is captured, version of the application is captured. This is a primary app that we are using, not the multi, uh, all the different versions. It's a primary version. Which platform was the primary one? What is the parallel count? Whatever information as metadata that is available over here. Inside the test itself, this test is marked as skip because one of the steps was not yet implemented. So over here though, we will see a lot of information around what are the environment variable system properties that were used for the execution. For each step that we've implemented, it will have detailed logs around those with screenshots, whichever again, you choose are important to be captured, but they'll automatically be attached in report portal. And likewise for all others. So in this case, if we look at guest two, which came on Chrome. So we see these are screenshots from the browser. Uh, earlier users were on a uh, Android device. So this is how TestWiz will be able to, uh, sorry, report portal is able to capture all the details. <coughs> Additionally, what we also have is, I mentioned we do visual testing also along with this. So we also have the visual test results over here with a link to the Apply Tools dashboard where you can see the visual test results as well. All that information is here. In addition, we also capture 
various different types of log files uh, from uh, the devices. We capture the device uh, logs or the browser logs and attach that uh, to report as well. So it is all there in one place. You don't have to rerun the test as much as we can. We want to try and avoid that. Capture all the information in one place. If the test fails, you should know exactly why it has failed and uh, take decisions based on that. So this is how Report Portal will be able to capture this. And of course, with Report Portal, you get the added capability of creating very interesting dashboards, which can give you trend analysis, uh, which can tell you which are your flaky tests. And this information can help you focus on which tests to prioritize in terms of fixing or following up with the devs along with that. Of course, you'll be able to tag these failures as saying, OK, I know this failure is, uh, for example, it's a automation uh, defect. And I'm going to tag it as automation defect. And uh, we move on from there. So again, in your dashboards, you can group based on what type of report or defects are there or issues are there in your test execution. And you can get insights into that aspect. <coughs> So this was from a report portal perspective, which gives you end-to-end -end visibility of your test execution. But I mentioned a couple of times earlier that we also use Apply tools for visual testing. What this means is it reduces the effort required for me to automate these tests. What type of validations do I need to have? And Apply tools will be able to give me your functional and visual validations. Anything that is different from what is expected in the baseline, you'll be able to capture it over here. So for example, I ran this test. This was uh, a single user test. This test has passed. In fact, this was a new test. There was no baseline found for it. And that's why it automatically saved it as a baseline. The next time I ran the same test, there was one uh, step which was unresolved. That means there were differences found over here. And if you look at it, what were the differences? This seems to be actually a genuine bug. So if I look at this, if I highlight these differences, you see that the layout of this particular screen is different. And I'm using an AI algorithm called strict, which means anything that is different to the human eyes, show that as a difference. And it is telling me these are all the differences that exist on the screen. I could also use a different algorithm to compare over here. If I use a layout algorithm, where I say I don't care about the data, as long as the structure of my page is the same, highlight that as a difference to me. And in this case also, it is highlighting areas where the layout seems to have broken. So we see there's a different section over here. In the app, uh, this particular uh, section is also gone uh, in a different location. So it is highlighting those areas where there are differences found. And at this point in time, if I have a defect management tool integrated, I could directly create a defect from here saying uh, extra layer found. Of course, you would give more meaningful names or defect will be created accordingly in your defect management system. At this point, you would do a thumbs down to mark the test as failed, and you are good to proceed. If you look at another test, over here, this seems to be a different type of issue. This particular screen, uh, probably uh, it's, a rota uh, it's dynamic content. There are different types of screens that show up over here. So maybe in this case, uh, again, a layout region could have been better. So I can use a layout region and I'll be able to proceed uh, from that aspect. In some cases, again, this image is much smaller than this other one. So the layout still seems to be different. I could also choose to ignore this because I don't care what comes up over here. That is fine. I'm just going to ignore this and I can proceed. Whatever changes I've done in terms of the algorithms can easily be done from code as well because the, as that, the automation engineer knows what type of uh, product uh, scenario is being executed and what validation is going to work best in that particular context. There is a question uh, asked, is it possible to prepare the device with specific state, like specific date, time, or locale? That is not a test viz responsibility. If you have control of your application or the device, you could set it up in that fashion and then start running the test. The test itself, you should not mix up the device setup state inside the implementation. But TestWiz does not offer that kind of capability. 
that is something that you would need to manage uh, on your own also quick uh, example uh, additional examples over here uh, just want to show different types of reports that are there so in this case i ran only the web test but i ran the test only on one browser but because i'm using the apply tools ultra fast grid i'm getting the visual validation results from all different browsers uh, at the same time automatically so what apply tools ultra fast grid does it captures the screenshot and re-renders the same information on all the different browsers devices and it is simply going to re-render it's not going to run it like an application it simply re-renders the same state of your application on the device or the browser and it will do a visual validation based on that and in this case as well you see over here uh, it's Sandeep exactly to your uh, point as well right in this case the timing is different and that's what has been flagged as a difference over here so in this case what I could do is I'll use a layout region I will say that this section is going to be layout I don't care what is the content inside it but as long as there is content I am okay if the content is missing this will show up as a difference found and it will be a defect that is there so this is another way how you could manage with dynamic uh, content of sorts uh, by using layout. Make sure the content, some content is there, but the specific content might not have to be there. It should not, it may not have to be the same data itself. Okay. So this is what Apply Tools will do for you. It will uh, tell you uh, automatically as part of running your functional tests. It will also do visual validation. And your test will fail whether you're running locally or in CI if there are visual differences as well. So you are increasing your test coverage by writing less code and you're getting full screen validations along with that. Uh, so functional issues, user experience issues, anywhere on the screen where you're doing a visual validation can be captured in this particular way. So this was about Apply Tools, uh, Report Portal and Apply Tools. There is also a third type of report that is integrated with uh, TestWiz, and that is a Cucumber HTML reports. And that is used uh, for a very specific purpose, which is how do you measure the feature coverage or the functional coverage from your uh, tests, which are at the top of the pyramid. Many times I've been asked this question, I want to know what is the code coverage from my functional tests. I think that is a bad idea to try and capture code coverage from your functional test. These are the tests which should be minimum in number at the top of the pyramid. With the minimum number of tests, what value are you going to get by knowing the code coverage? You do not want a very high code coverage anyway for that. Why do you want to capture it? Instead, what uh, TestWiz does, it creates this functional coverage report where using this approach of annotations that we have on the scenarios, it will, for those annotations, it will create a heat map of sorts, a statistics chart of sorts to say which tag is used how many times and what was the status of those. So this gives you an indication of what type of tests are running. And this is purely dynamic, right? So you could create additional tags in your tests. So for example, I have over here a tag multi-user and single app. I could also say over here, this is about chat. In another test, I could have about uh, screen share, whatever those functionalities are. And you could have as many of those as you want over here. Whichever tags you add, they will be included in the tag statistics. And based on those tag statistics, you will be able to infer what is happening in your implementation. Are you focusing on some functional areas more than uh, required based on the risk or the value of that functionality? So this gives you a good indication of what your coverage is. And based on this coverage data, you could get an indication if there are certain critical modules which do not have sufficient coverage, how do you increase coverage on that in that area? So this is how uh, different types of reports can be leveraged from TestWiz to get that coverage, get the visual validation, and get one place uh, information for all of these different types of a test that is running. If anything fails, you know what is going on and trend analysis can also happen on that. One very important aspect I forgot to highlight about Apply Tools, which might be very valuable, is Apply Tools has the capability of doing contrast advisor checks as well. 
So in this particular case, <coughs> we are able to see, so this uh, probably is a bad example. Let's look at a mobile app. So in this particular case, if I do a accessibility check or contrast advisor check, you can select if it is WCAG 2.0 or 2.1, level AA or AAA. And based on this, you are able to see how many violations are there. There are two violations over here. You hover over those violations and it says actual contrast is 3.55, expected is 4.5. In this particular case, it is saying 4.49 versus 5. So it is giving you indication of what is the status of your validations. And based on this, you can serve it as an input into your design team, into your development cycle to make it compliant based on what is expected for your application. So this again becomes a very easy way to get more value from the existing tool set that you're using and uh, you'll be able to proceed accordingly. Okay, so let's start summarizing. What are the unique capabilities of TestWiz? First of all, it's a uh, open source framework. That is not unique but you can automate real user scenarios. And that is multi-user, multi-device, multi-app. That part definitely is unique in my opinion. It also has various different cloud device farm integrations. It supports web browsers, mobile web browsers, Android apps, iOS apps, Windows desktop applications as well. The tech stack that is used is Cucumber JVM to specify your test intent. It uses APM test distribution under the hoods to manage Android, iOS devices, and APM. Of course, it uses APM to manage this aspect. Uh, it uses Selenium WebDriver to interact and control the browser, report portal for reporting, visual testing uh, using AptiTools Visual AI and the AptiTools Ultrafast Grid. And we use Gradle as a build tool for this. Running TestWiz is very simple. It's all command line based. There are a lot of defaults that TestWiz has internally, which will need to be overridden in the property files that we saw the examples of. But whatever is there in the property files can also be overridden by the environment variables, which is the command that I was executing uh, from uh, for the demo perspective to run specific types of tests. Okay. So that is how the uh, overrides happen. Defaults overridden by property files, overridden by environment variables. And this approach makes it very easy to run different types of tests, different platforms uh, on local versus device farm, just by giving different parameters at command line or as environment variables, you don't have to make any changes in code, which also means on local, you might want to run different types of tests. In CI, you want to run different types of tests, but there are no changes required other than the variables that you're providing. So how do we proceed from here? One way is if you find this is interesting, you can use getting started with TestWiz, which is a sample project that uses TestWiz as a library. The test that I ran right now in the demo, they are already part of that. So you could just simply clone this repo, run the same command that I ran, which is there in the readme as well as in the feature file, and you are ready to run with TestWiz. Then based on that, you would just simply start replacing the sample test with your own implementation for your application and you are good to go. The other way, of course, it is an open source project. There are a lot of tools and capabilities, uh, rather a lot of enhancements and capabilities that we want to add in TestWiz. Some things that are there in my mind, based on your use case, you might find other interesting things that you want to add. I would love to get a pull request from you so that we can enhance the same and make it available for everyone as well. So these are two potential ways how you could leverage TestWiz. And of course, please reach out to me even after this conversation. I would love to hear from you and uh, get your ideas on TestWiz or this approach or any other aspect related with testing and automation. Thank you so much for this opportunity again. It was great speaking with you. And again, apologies for the interruption in between. Let's see if there are any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Alan, for such an in-depth knowledge around testing. Uh, being an Android developer myself, uh, I found it very hard 
to automate all these things and write it. Um, one of the queries which I have personally, like what I have experienced from my experiences, like um, all this is very really nice, but I always feel that when you're trying to test something with the UI or trying to put it every time on the screen, it takes a lot of time. So does it really make sense to run this? Because even if like it takes a hell amount of time for your CI to run them, do you get the enough value out of it? Uh, absolutely. I think that's a great question. Uh, these tests are painfully slow. That's why even in the demo, I had to keep skipping forward. I don't want you to wait for such a long time for the test to run. And that is because you have to prep the device. You have to install the app. You have to launch the app. Some apps are lightweight. Some apps are very heavy uh, weight. It takes a long time to do that. If you're doing this on local versus in uh, device farms, that timing would vary again. So you would want to keep these types of the, any UI test as less as possible. Each test is important. So don't get me wrong. Each test is important to be automated, but you don't need to automate it at the UI layer. I always start by thinking if there's a test case or a scenario that is important, can I automate it as a unit test first? If not as a unit test, can I do that, automate that as either an API test or a UI component test? Or could it be a contract test, whether provider side or consumer side? Could it be an API test? Could it be an API workflow test? Could it be a UI component test? These are all very different types of application uh, tests, right? A UI component is different from a UI component workflow test for that matter. Where in a UI component, this is something what uh, Sandeep was also referring to earlier. I set the state of my application and go directly to step five of my workflow and test only that. That is a pure component test, right? I have set up the data, just go directly to that stage of the workflow and implement that. A UI workflow test or UI component workflow test, I'm still thinking what is the right term for it, is something where you are stubbing out all the API calls that are going from your application, but you are implementing the workflow. So in the examples that I showed, can I log in, start a meeting, send chat messages, but there are no calls going out of my application to the actual endpoints. I have stubbed all of those out, but I'm implementing a workflow in that fashion, right? Uh, so that's a very different and interesting type of test, which is very valuable, especially if your APIs are taking a long time or there's a lot of dependencies on external systems, you can stub it out in that way. So yes, you want to have as less tests at the top as possible, but at the same time, you cannot avoid these as well. At some point in time, you want to make sure all the pieces are actually coming together. Your user experience is also as you expected that you want to give to your end users. You want to validate that and not leave it to chance. So it's all a matter of risk, the risk appetite that you have for your application. What is the risk of something going wrong in production? And what is going to be the impact of that? What it is going to take to fix that? Based on the answer to these, you should say, is UI testing required? If yes, you should do it. The multi-user testing, multi-app testing is even a layer above this UI test. Because now you're thinking about multiple applications, multiple devices. It's going to take even longer time. So these tests should be even fewer than before. But it will be good to have some tests, depending again on the context of the application, which goes through this journey, just the happy path. right? Because all the negative cases, edge cases, the detailed cases will be taken care of by each application independently. But do they all talk to each other in a timeline that matches the, your expectations of the application? You want to validate that as part of automation. So that's where this would come in. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I just popped up a small notification earlier as well. You can use chat to ask question to Anand and take a best use of his experience of how to test a mobile application. Uh, Anand, one more thing uh, while we are waiting for a qu a questions from uh, uh, users to come in. Yep. Um, like, I know that people say that you must have as many test cases as possible, but in a real world application, what do you think is a right number of a uh, test coverage percentage? Like say people say that you must have hundred percent test coverage, but in a practical uh, world, uh, I have, I have never got that opportunity to reach hundred percent, but in your uh, experience, what is the right yeah. number? 
there's a very good uh, small story behind this uh, question and this is not a uncommon question right it's a very common question especially as a consultant i get asked a lot when i go to clients one client about maybe around 10 11 years ago asked me this question that i want 100% test coverage and i had gone on a discovery uh, discussion to them i want 100% test coverage uh, 100% automation i said of course yes i can give you that but i will define what 100% means right not every test is important to be automated not every test is important to be automated at the top layer for sure it is every test that you write it's like product code every line of code you write is tech debt eventual tech debt you want to make good use of your time what is the risk of something going wrong you have to start with that what is the impact if that risk comes true and then you think about how you're going to prevent that you want to use automation as a means to reduce your time taken for manual testing but you want to use the time that is reduced for manual testing to do more exploratory testing so you want to have a good balance between automation and exploratory testing you of course whatever is important you have to automate start from the lowest layers of the pyramid and automate that but not everything is probably important to be automated not everything can be automated okay uh thank you um we'll wait for a few more minutes uh for people to ask in questions think so uh, i don't have uh, any other question as of now so i would like to thank you once again anand for sharing such an in depth knowledge around how to test mobile apps and it was nice meeting you uh, virtually thank you once again thank for you. coming on the platform thank you so much mohit and the whole team thank you everyone take care